This week we're going to talk about a couple ways we can encode information. And in particular, we're going to talk about how we can encode binary strings, meaning strings of ones and zeros. Now, one example where uh, binary strings are used is in barcodes. And the end of chapter 16 discusses several different types of barcodes. Now, a barcode is just well, it's a bunch of bars, a bunch of black bars on a white background. And the way that works is a light is shined on the barcode and the black bars do not reflect much light back. But the space in between the bars, the uh, white bars, do reflect back a good amount of light. And the amount of light that's reflected back is translated into a string of zeros and ones. And there are various, well, there are many different kinds of barcodes. Um, so the uh, last two sections of uh, chapter 16 are definitely worth looking at to see. Um, they talk about three or four different kinds of barcodes. The, the normal barcode on products and then um, like a, a barcode for, uh, that, that the, uh, what the post office uses on envelopes. Uh, there are two different barcodes they talk about that. So, um, I'm not going to ask you any questions on barcodes specifically. I might ask you questions on encoding these binary strings of digits. And uh, we'll talk about, um, well, we'll talk about a couple. We'll start with this one. Suppose you want to send the message. I just, sometimes it's hard to speak and write at the same time. Suppose you want to send the message 1001. Now, computers can handle very long strings of ones and zeros. Humans can also handle very large strings of ones and zeros, but we don't want one example to take the entire semester. So suppose you want to send 1001. We're going to encode this. And we're going to use a Venn diagram to encode this. So the goal of this example is to encode 1001. And we're going to use a Venn diagram. A Venn diagram with three circles. That's supposed to be a circle. And we're going to number these regions. Well, first we're going to label the circles. This will be circle A. So that entire circles A, circle B, and circle C. And we're going to number these regions. One, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven. You can already see we're having, we have a string of four digits. We're going to use this relatively large Venn diagram to encode this. If we had a larger string, it would be much more complicated. But what we're going to do to encode this is actually quite simple. We're going to consider those regions. I'm just going to redraw this without numbering the regions. We're going to consider those regions. And then in regions 1, 2, 3, and 4, we're going to put these numbers. So the first digit is 1. We'll put that in region 1. The second digit is 0, we put that in region 2. Third digit is 0, we put that in region 3. Fourth digit is 1, we put that in region 4. And now we have three more regions we want to fill out. So the next thing we're going to do, so I'll say next, fill in 5, 6, and 7 so that the sum in each circle is even. And we're going to use this idea to encode this binary string. So the sum in each circle, I don't mean each of these seven regions, even. I mean fill it in so that the sum in circle A, B, and in circle A, and the sum in circle B, and the sum in circle C is even. 
So how are we going to do that? Well, in circle A, we have a 1, a 0, and a 0. 1 plus 0 plus 0 is 1. So if we want that sum to be even, we're going to need another 1. So now in circle A, which is what, regions 1, 2, 3, and 5, the sum is 2, which is even. In region B, we already have a 1, a 0, and a 1. 1 plus 0 plus 1 is 0. It's not 0. 1 plus 0 plus 1 is 2, which is even. So we're going to put a 0 here. Remember, we're working with only zeros and 1s. In region C, circle C, we have 1, 0, and 0 already. Those add to 1. 1 is odd, so we need another 1 there to um, make the sum in circle C even. And once this is all filled out, we can now encode 1, 0, 0, 1. So um, how should I write that? Um, let's erase this and write it over here. So with that, our conclusion is 1, 0, 0, 1 is encoded. Well, how do we encode it using this? Well, we just read off these numbers in the order of the region. So remember how the regions were numbered, which is what I just erased. It was region 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So it is encoded starting at region 1. We have 1. So remember, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So 1, 0, 0, 1, and then 1, 0, 1. So we've now encoded 1, 0, 0, 1. Now this method could also detect errors. From this, using uh, that sentence, we can detect errors. So let's um, suppose instead of, what was the correct digit? I should leave that correct one up here. Now nah, I'll just erase it and rewrite it. I have it written in my notes. So the idea here is the sum in each circle is even. So first we need to remember which order we um, labeled the pieces of the Venn diagram, and then we need to remember the sum in each circle needs to be even. So suppose, for some reason in transmitting this encoded information, suppose the received message is received as um, zero 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 one one zero one. So remember how we encoded that. We encoded that as we encoded it as one zero zero one one zero one. So just from the work we already did, we know that there's an error in position one. But suppose we didn't know what it was supposed to be, and suppose our machine received the message as 0001101. Could this detect that error? And the answer is yes, it could detect the error, and it could detect which position the error occurs in. And all we have to do to figure that out, well, maybe I should, um, write something to do it. We're just, with these written directions, we're just supposing. Suppose the received message is received. Um, is this a possible received message, given that uh, construction? Is this possible? And if it's not possible, which I will, we will show it isn't. Um, so if not, in which position does an error occur? So is this possible? We'll answer that first. And we'll do that by filling in the Venn diagram. And we want the sum in each circle to be even. 
Now, when filling this in, we don't just fill in 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. We fill it in in the same order that we numbered the regions before. So this was region 1, so we put 0. Region 2, region 3, region 4, region 5, region 6, region 7. And yes, I see the error. So how did we fill that in? This goes in region 1, this goes in region 2, this goes in region 3, this goes in region 4, region 5, region 6, and region 7. Now how can we detect if an error occurred? Well, what we need to do is check that the sum in each circle is even. So remember how we labeled this. We labeled, what, circle A, circle B, and circle C. So let's find the sum in circle A. So sum in circle A, I'm just going to say sum in A, is what? 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0, which equals 1. So right now, we know that an error occurred in position and in circle A because this sum is not even. But we also have to check, well, if, an, if we know just from that that the error occurred in position A, that doesn't tell us too much because the error could occur here where it's only position A, or it could occur here where it's A and B, or it could occur here where it's A and C, or it could occur in the middle in A, B, and C. So what we have to do is next find the sum in B and C. So what's the sum in B? The sum in B, 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 1, which equals 1. So right now, we know that there's an error in A and an error in B. But now let's see if there's also an error in C. The sum in circle C, 0 plus 0 plus 1 plus 1, which is 2. So from these computations, we know that an error occurred in A and an error occurred in B. Um, I guess I should actually write down an answer. Um, well, actually, the, there are two parts of this question. Is this possible? If not, in which position did an error occur? If we did all of these sums and got an even number, for each one, then the answer would be yes, it is a possible received message. But right here, we found one of the sums is odd, so that allows us to conclude no, this is not a possible received message. So um, I'm going to erase this now, and I'll write down an answer to these questions. So this message let's spell message correctly, is not possible. And it was not possible because the sum in A is odd, sum in B is odd, sum in C is even, so since one of them is odd, it's not possible. And if it's not possible, in which position does an error occur? Well, remember what we just showed. We just showed that the error happens in A, and the error happens in B. So in which of these seven regions, or which of these seven regions hits exactly A and B? Well, this one hits A and B. This one down here is A and C. This is just A. This is just B. This is B and C. That's A, B, and C. And we know from these computations that the error occurs in a and B. And which region that corresponds to is region 1. So the error occurs in region 1, so the error in this code occurs in position 1. In other words, um, this one is wrong. And a correct message would have been 1001101. Now, another thing we'll look at is 
a method of, well, two methods of compressing data. So right here, this is a seven string digit. If we, if we had a very long string and we had many millions of them and we're a computer, well, then maybe handling all of that information would cause us to slow down. So a computer might like to compress data in a certain way. Biologists know that genes are given by, or can be represented by, or maybe they are given by, I'm not a biology expert, but they know that genes can be described by sequences of adenine, cysteine, what, thymine, and guanine, I think. I just wrote A, C, T, and G. I think that's what they're called. Um, I haven't seen biology in a while. And let's say they want to encode a string of genes, or encode a, a gene which is given by a string of these letters, and let's say they want to encode it using this encoding method. So um, this arrow, it's an arrow with like a vertical line on the left side of it. Uh, that just is a math way of saying, um, it's really a function notation. It's red maps to, so A maps to 0, 0, C maps to 0, 1, and so on. Uh, it's a useful symbol. Um, I would guess um, most of you have not seen this symbol. Um, I didn't see it till my second year of college um, in an introduction to a proof class, so I would certainly not expect you to have seen that symbol. But it is a useful symbol for function notation. So the, let's uh, take a gene. Let's suppose a gene is given by is given by these, uh, this string of these amino acids. A, 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 C, A, G, T, C, A, A. Let's suppose this is a gene. I don't know if this is possible. I imagine every one is possible. I, I, I am not a biology student. So suppose this is a gene. Well, to encode this, all we do is replace each letter with these. So to encode this, so uh, we encode this using uh, this information. So every A is replaced with a zero, zero, and so on. So we encode this as zero, 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 zero for three A's. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. C is what? 0, 1. I'm blocking it. C is 0, 1. A is 0, 0. G is 1, 1. T is 1, 0. C is 0, 1. And A is 0, 0. And that last A is also a 0, 0. Now this is almost identical to an example in the book. In the book they wrote GTAAC. I changed it to GTC because my brother's initials are GTC. But right here, this is a perfectly fine encoding method. But suppose biologists know a little bit more about the frequency at which each of these amino acids shows up in a gene. So suppose, uh, where should I write this? Uh, man, I'll just erase this. So let's, uh, I want to leave this on the board and this on the board so I don't have to rewrite that. So suppose A occurs now, in this example, A occurs most frequently, but suppose in general, A occurs most frequently. And suppose C occurs second most frequently. 
and then G and T occur third most frequently about the same. Well, if we know this, we might uh, suspect that this could be a more efficient encoding method that I'm about to write. So this right here, so the following encoding method. So we expect it may be more efficient. It will be more efficient. So I'll just say the following encoding method is more efficient. And something that is more efficient will generally take less time on a computer. So instead of having two characters for each of these letters, uh, what did I say? A, C, T, G. I don't know if I said their actual names correctly before. Um, I hope I did. That'd be embarrassing if I didn't. Well, maybe not embarrassing. It's just biology. So A occurs most frequently, so let's instead use a single character for A. C occurs next most frequently. Let's use two characters for that. T and G occur third most frequently. We will use three characters for those. So we would expect that this might be more efficient based on um, this information up here, and we will show that it is. So this is um, initial encoding. I'll just block this off as the initial encoding. Now with this new method, so I'll call it compressed encoding, would give us the following. So A is 0. There are three A's at the beginning, so 0 is a 0. C is 1, 0. A is another 0. G, now, um, T and G used to be, uh, we used to use two characters for each of T and G. Now we're using three. But notice A occurs most frequently, so there is a chance that the uh, loss of, what, or there's a chance that using one character instead of two for each A will make up for using three instead of two for T and G. And with this, there it is. Um, so where were we? We did up to A, so G is one, one, one. T is one, one, zero. C is one, zero. A is 0, and A is 0. And now let's just count the characters we used for each of these encodings. Up here we had 20, because this is 10, and each one is 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, 18, 20. Now down here with this compressed encoding, how many characters? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 16 characters. So this is a more compressed way of encoding this. Now, um, this example, it's a relatively basic example because I just gave you, let's replace A, C, T, and G with each of these strings of zeros and ones. But let's look at a way we can come up with, a way we can come up with these encoding rules. Before we do that, I should mention that with these rules, there is a way to go from, so we went from a string of amino acids to a string of zeros and ones. We could also go from this string of zeros and ones back up here, based on this encoding. And the way we do that is just by reading right to left and stopping when we get a character. So right here, we have a zero, so that's an A. The next zero is another A. That zero is another A. Now what about this one? Well, one isn't here, so you have to go to the next character also. One zero, is one zero here? Yes, one zero is here. So maybe I'll write underneath. A, 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 and then one zero was C. Zero is here, so that's A. Now the next one we have one, which isn't there, 
one one which also isn't there but one 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 is there and that's G and then next we have one which isn't there so you have to go to the next character one one which isn't there so you have to go to the next character one one zero which is there that's a T and then one which isn't there one zero is there so that's a C and then zero is A and zero is A so you could go forward and backwards with this and up, up here since each one was just two characters, the way to go backward would have been to just do uh, each two characters, about A, 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 and so on. But next we'll look at a relatively complicated way of coming up with these encoding rules. And it is called Huffman coding. Now Huffman was a uh, mathematician in the uh, 50s. He was a graduate student when he came up with this encoding method and it's still used today. Now, the 1950s is a, a relatively, well, it's relatively recent as far as mathematics is concerned. Um, but of course, coding theory really existed only since about the 1940s. Um, but this is a very useful method of encoding, and it is still used today. And this is the type of problem we could see with it. Say the given letters occur with the given frequencies. So all those frequencies add up to 100%. Um, so A occurs 0 0.09, B occurs 0.21, C occurs 0.13, D 0.29, and E 0.28. And we want to, well, we're going to eventually figure out how we can encode each of those letters. And we're going to use that to encode this string of letters, B, E, E, C, A, D, E. And then we're going to decode 1101000000. 1011. Now I'm going to erase this and I'm going to write it again toward the end um, once we actually do that. But first we need to figure out how we are going to encode these. And we're going to follow a few steps. The first step arrange these in order of increasing frequency. So I'll just say arrange in increasing order. So the lowest number, 0 0.09, that'll go first. The next lowest number, 0.13 for C. 0.13. Next lowest number, 0.21 with B. 0.21. Next lowest number, 0.28 with E. And then D occurs point two nine and the next thing we're going to do um, actually describing the next step in words would take like three or four sentences so I'm just going to say merge by combining lowest two probabilities And we're going to do that until everything is combined. And we'll see what we mean uh, when I write these steps out. Um, uh, are these all going to fit? How many steps are there? Four steps. Um, okay. Well, let's do this. This is probably not going to fit on one board, which is unfortunate. But the, well, that's okay. The lowest two are A and C. So let's write that down. And we're going to write it down by putting the lower one first, meaning the lowest two are A and C. We're going to write it as A, C. Now what do they add to? They add to 0 0.22. 0 0.09, 0 0.13, add to 0.22. So we combine the lowest two, and then we just rewrite the rest while preserving this order. So we have to write B, E, and D. Now B occurs 0 0.21. 0 0.21 is less than 0.22. So we're going to put B up here and E and D, 0.28 and 0.29, occur down here. I like this example because my initials, well, if you ignore my middle name, which starts with a K, my initials are A, C. So we've combined the lowest two. Now we're going to keep doing that until everything is combined. And how are we going to do that? 
Well, next we have the lowest two are B and AC. Remember, when we're doing this combination, we're always going to want to write them in increasing order. This will not work. This method won't work if we don't write them in increasing order. So next, we have BAC. And we're again going to write the lower one on the left. B, A, and C add to 0.43. Well, that takes care of B and A, C, but now we need to write E and D. We're not combining them yet. E and D are 0.28 and 0.29. Those are both less than this, so these are going to go above it. So we have E at 0.28 and D at 0.29. Uh, okay, where am I going to erase? I guess I'm going to erase over here. So when I, um, when I write these out, I'd like to write them in a kind of order. So, well, I would like to write them all on one horizontal thing. But if I were taking notes and I came to an end of a page, I would next go down here, kind of between these two, because there are going to be two more steps. And the next two steps are still going to be merging these by combining the lowest two probabilities. So next we have ED, BAC. We combine the lowest two. We're not going to keep adding on to BAC here because BAC is not the lowest two, is not one of the lowest two. We combine the lowest two. The lowest two are ED. So I'm going to write that, I guess, here. The lowest two, E, D, those add to 0.57. Well, and then we have to put B, A, C back up here. B, A, C is 0.43, and that's less than 0.57, so we write it above. Notice we wrote E, D, because E is lower than D. Well, and then we have just one more step combining these two. We're still going to combine the lowest two probabilities. In this case, the lowest two um, cover everything. So we're going to write them again with the lower one on the left, B-A-C-E-D. And this occurs 100%. One of those occurs 100% of the time. So right here, once we get here, that is all of the work we need to do to set up what we're going to do. And well, we need all five of those steps that we did. Um, so hopefully you've written them down. If you haven't, well, I've just rewritten those five uh, steps we did. So I labeled them numbers one, two, three, four, and five up here. So we started with uh, them in this order. We combined A and C and put them in order. Then we combine B and AC, which added to 0.43, put them in order. Then we combine E and D, added to 0.57, put them in order. Then we combine BAC and ED, and uh, that added to one. Now, I, I did want to rewrite them because when forming this next uh, tree that we're going to form, um, it's nice to be able to look back at them. And you'll see what I mean in a moment. So uh, step two, was merge them by combining things. Step three, this is different than this three. Step three is make a tree. Make which tree? This tree. Uh, we're gonna start with B, A, C, E, D. Um, let's write it like this. I'm just trying to figure out how, how it'll best fit on the board. Okay. So let's just write B, A, C, E, D like this. Now when you're doing this, you could write the probabilities out. Uh, I guess I will. That occurs all the time, one of those letters. But then we're going to just break it down, kind of working backwards. What do I mean by that? Well, we're going to break it down like this. B, A, C, E, D, the step before, we have B, A, C, and E, D. 
So we're going to write it like this, BAC and ED. And our goal is going to be to get all the way down so that they're just single letters. Now, just doing this isn't really going to help us create an encoding method. And we've put these in increasing order to help us in the following step. Right here, BAC occurred point B or A or C occurs 43% of the time. E or D occurs 57% of the time. The lower one, we're going to put a zero on that line. The larger one, we're going to put a one on that line. And we're going to keep doing this. BAC, well, BAC gets broken down in step two. So let's go in step three is where E and D were combined. So next thing we'll do is work backwards from E and D. E and D broke like that. E is lower than D. E was what, 0.28? D was 0.29. 0.28 is less than 0.29. So we put a zero there, and we put a one there. Now to break BAC down, well first, first in a backwards sense, first we have B and AC. So we have B and AC. B occurred 21%, AC, A or C occurred 22%, 21 is less than 22, um, 0, 1. So and since we're always putting the lesser one on the left, and the lesser one on top, um, the zeros are always going to go on the left. So you don't necessarily have to write out those probabilities, but um, I guess I did for this example. The last breakdown we have to do is AC. AC, A occurred 9%, C occurred, what was the other number, 13%. 9 is less than 13, so we put a 0 there and a 1 there. Now, how does this help us reach our goal? Well, we can use this tree to associate a string of zeros and 1s to each of A, B, C, D, and E. A distinct uh, string of zeros and 1s to each of A, B, C, D, and E. So, all of this work we did was to get us the following. So we can now encode, so we now have the following encoding, what, encoding scheme. I'm just going to write these in order, A, B, C, D, E. And how do we get this? Well, we start at the top and we go down to each letter. So to get down to A, A is the first letter I wrote, so let's do A first. From the top, you go, <coughs> excuse me, you go down there, you go over there, then you go down there. And which zeros and ones did we use? Well, we used a zero, a one, and a zero. So for A, we have 0, 1, 0. For B, well, B we got here, 0, 0. For C, C is down here, 0, 1, 1. For D, where's D? Over there, 1, 1. And for E, one, zero. Excuse me, I just uh, hiccuped. I hope that doesn't last. Where were we? E was one, zero. So right now, we've figured out a way to associate zeros and ones using Huffman coding. So now we can actually answer the two parts of the question that were asked. So what were the two things that were asked? Uh, so part one was encode B, E, E, C, A, D, E. Part two was decode, pretend that says decode, uh, one, one, zero, one, zero.
zero, 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 one, zero, one, one. So to encode this, all we have to do is replace each letter with the numbers. So B is zero, zero, E is one, zero, E is one, zero, C is zero, one, one, a is zero one zero. D is one one. And E was one zero. Um, so right here we've encoded B K. Um, I couldn't really come up with many uh, long enough words to use an actual word. So I thought B K sounded close enough to a real word. We've encoded B, K. So I'm going to erase this now because it went on to the next board. And now we will decode this. Now to decode this, we're just going to work left to right and stop once we get one of these letters. So 1 isn't there. 1, 1 is. 1, 1 is D. Well, that's great. Zero. Zero is not there. One. Or, no, no, sorry, zero, one. Zero, one is not there. Zero, one, zero. Well, zero, one, zero is there. It's A. Okay? Zero. Zero is not there. Zero, zero, however, is there. Zero, zero is B. Well, next we have 0, which isn't there, and then 0 is there. But it, we have 0, which is not there, but then 0, 0 is there. It's another B. That's a B. Well, what do we have after this? We have 1. 1 isn't over there. 1, 0. Is 1, 0 over there? Yes, 1, 0 is over there. 1, 0 is E. Well, then we have 1, which isn't there. 1, 1, which is there. 1, 1 is D. So decoding this is the word dabbed. Uh, that was the largest word I could figure out within a, what, a couple minutes of just looking at those letters. So I used that as the decoding. I mean, bed is also one, but I mean, that's a three-letter word. Dabbed is six letters. Um, so this uh, method, this Huffman coding, is reasonably complicated, and it's very easy to make a mistake when arranging those probabilities. So uh, definitely uh, try this. There is an example on the worksheet. There's an example in the homework. Um, on the worksheet, there are six letters. Uh, in the homework, it's four letters. Um, so definitely try to do the worksheet one. Um, in the textbook, in section... I don't know, somewhere in chapter 17, I think it's 17.3. Uh, there's another example with six letters. So I, I intentionally didn't do that example because I wanted to reference that example as another one you could work through to see how this process works. So definitely try that. Um, it is re relatively complicated. So uh, when you're working on it, each step you do, definitely take a moment to uh, Look back at your work and make sure you wrote things in the right order. Um, but it would be a good idea to try to go through that example in the uh, in the um, in the textbook because that one has an answer given to you. Um, so see how that goes.